right, Dan, good to see you. Saturday what is morning. going on? Yes, yeah, Saturday morning. Not bathed. Not, here, so. not bathed. So this is the, the hat. As I yes. mentioned earlier, I, uh, I smell like deviled ham. Whatever I don't bathe for a while, I, uh, I smell like a potted meat. Oh my goodness. So, okay, uh, potted meat. I yes, have not eaten that. I haven't bathed right in a couple there. of... Fourth of July and all that sort of stuff and yeah, we just had the Fourth of July. Did you see the fireworks or there? I yeah, I was in Atlanta. I was on top of this building and I saw fireworks from like it was a. They were all many of them were far away, but I could see them from a surround. Centennial Park, Decatur, uh, Buckhead, all these sorts of places. Boom, they were all going on around here. It's okay. amazing. Oh, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I like that idea. For a brief moment, I I felt okay to be alive. Just for, okay, a small, just for a small, just just for a small moment. moment. <laughs> you know, I think we need to work on expanding that for could. you, uh, particularly, could, so yeah. you can enjoy this ride. Uh, you know what else I have found that helps me to, um, to, to, to enjoy life is um, this wonderful new refreshing beverage, Supercharged. Supercharged. Okay. <laughs> I <think. laughs> okay. I want to. I'll just leave it right there. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, that. Uh, that mentioned there, I'm sure the guys upstairs appreciate that as well. So, uh, so what's been on your, so what's been on your mind? So they could break into a commercial and it would go south. And okay, okay. We all know that. Everyone watching this absolutely knows that. So, I, we, we should, I could do, I could do commercials. I see. What I was thinking with a couple of you, you brought something up, but I also had yeah. something on the on the drive up. To, um, it's a family tradition that we listen to. Uh, David Sedaris, Sedaris audiobooks. Okay. That's what we did, you know. For a while there was, uh, we were listening to Ayn Rand audiobooks. Oh, no. But, um, that was not happening. But, yeah, okay. yeah. That didn't happen. But, but uh, suddenly I, I found my, at one point my son, he was uh, uh, he was 10 at the time, I, I found him uh, attempting to club a, a poor person to death. Okay. And that's okay. when I realized we needed to... Uh, we might stop. need to pay attention a little bit more. We uh, need to stop the Ayn Rand. Yeah. So, um, but, <laughs> we, uh, so we've been, people we've been, can put those two together later. All right, there we go. We've been listening to like some David Sedaris, you know, and um, which is interesting because sometimes some of what he talks about is not kid friendly, so you have to right. hover near the uh, the pause button okay. to be able to move through some things. Because he does this one story about Fire Island that uh, not for kids. Okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's funny, it's just not for kids. Yeah, right. So right. We're, we're we're up there. We're, we're part heading of your toward, job, right? It's it's, uh, yeah, but I thought part of my job actually uh, is to um, to guide him through um, uh, tactical shaming. Yeah, we talked <laughs> about your parental shaming earlier. That's right. Um, I'm going to write a book on uh, uh, yeah, shame-based no, parenting. Gonna, this but, is uh, this is there's a need for an intervention on that for sure. <laughs> there is. It probably okay. is. So, so we're we're in the car. We're we're whew, we're going up, and suddenly Sedaris tells a story that's there is. His stories are autobiographical, and I'm sure there's, there's a little uh, liberty taken in this one. But talks about when he was younger, somewhere in the age between six. I will actually, he makes it sound like it started somewhere around that time, when he had these severe obsessive compulsive symptoms. Like he would be in right. a classroom, he would get up 28 times during classroom, and he would go and have to lick the light switch. Uh, on the way home, he would have to lick mailboxes, statues in people's yards. Um, he would have to lick the doorknob to his house. He would have to kiss the stairs. There were all these sort of things, and he would. So, what would a ten-minute walk would be an hour and a half, and it would, was just sort of um, uh, riddled and weighed with all these rituals that you have to go through. Boom, boom, it boom. seems uh, very interesting too, because. Uh, with the tongue, he has to lick things, mm -hmm. that's germs and everything, it's, and, that's, you know, it, you, that's got to drive somebody crazy in his household, I'm sure, don't they? Well, the teacher was rather yeah. upset, it began with the teacher sort of wanting a, um, of sending a letter home to his mom to address these things, okay. and the teacher, at least from his perspective, wasn't quite understanding what this all could mean. She right. thought it was just simply sort of a, right. she didn't... Um, really bizarre in some ways, and that's why uh, mm -hmm. you're not going to come to a quick understanding of that until you look at it a little well, bit. Well, yes, and, you, that, right? and you, you might want to, you know, most of the classroom, you'd want to touch things with the glove, you know, and that kid's around. Right, everybody can wear his gloves now. But, <laughs> but the, uh, so, and he tells the story, oddly enough, he, he makes it relatively humorous, but if you've ever been subject to obsessive compulsive symptoms or known someone who has, they are... Uh, they are terrifying, and they are uh, they're hell. They just really are. They're just they're right. just they're tough. 
and right. um, to be it's, plagued it's by. It's kind of associated, uh, I mean, it's anxiety, mm -hmm. right? It falls into that camp. Mm -hmm. and look at anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. illness, those well, kinds of things, for sure. And that's where it becomes sort of interesting because um, if you look at it from a purely biological stance, we, we, we can say that maybe it is um, something awry with the nervous system, we could say that. And certainly in very extreme cases, that there, there, there seems to be some uh, uh, genetic pull, history of uh, severe obsessive uh, disorder in families often. But uh, one way to think about it would, would be, because I tend to, I don't know if you know this, but I look at things psychoanalytically. Sure. Sometimes, every once in a while. I yeah, every once in a while. Like oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, oh, yeah. It's, cool. yeah. So, we can think about it. If, if at the core it is anxiety, obsessive compulsive symptoms are an attempt at a solution. It is, um, it is what Freud called making the best of a bad job. Everything that was, um, all of these obsessive acts, these or these obsessive thoughts and compulsive acts, were are all circle around a, um, a central and core anxiety, and that they are attempts to mediate that. They're attempts to be able to do something with it. And if you, for instance, he he makes just a passing mention what was going on at a time when, when these things really became difficult. His parents had just moved from the north okay. to uh, North Carolina. And they were living in this temporary house. And so you can see that uh, at that moment he was placed under a tremendous amount of pressure and stress. Okay. And as a kid, uh, whatever tendency he had toward um, uh, compulsive activity and obsessive thought, suddenly became increasingly exacerbated as a result of this change. And so the solution became even more drastic and dire. And as you can see, um, the, developmentally there are all these sorts of, uh, particularly as we move, um, move into middle school, uh, social pressures, uh, puberty, uh, there are both internal and external stressors that occur as a result of their developmental arc and they, they, can, they tend to increase. And so, um, yeah, and that, I, I was I was interested in his age at the time. You didn't mm -hmm. mention that, but I, I'm assuming it was middle school. Or something I think like so. That. I think I, I think he was said he was. Um, I think he was ten or eleven. I may be wrong, um, but it, it seemed to be somewhere okay. around that area, okay. fourth, fifth, sixth grade, something like that. It was just de developmental. Yeah, in terms of he was he was right right there in that in that sort of spot, okay. and. Um, so you can see that it's, it's, it's an attempt to be able to, um, uh, to cope. And it's what makes it sort of uh, like most symptoms, and this is the way you sort of think about this, this is the way particularly psychoanalytically we define a symptom. It provide, provides an immediate and limited but very effective solution to the anxiety at hand. But long term, it tends to feed itself. So it's a symptom that begins to actually reinforce itself and make itself worse because if his anxiety on some level was feeling alone and vulnerable moving away from friends and family and a network of connections that somehow made him feel supported as soon as he comes to a new place uh, licking doorknobs and light switches is not going to make you connected to people no as a matter of fact it's going to run people in the opposite right. direction or, or he's going to suffer some real consequences from other people and the vicious spiral of that is it begins to get worse and worse and worse and so the problem you fix now requires more of the same um, fix and then it, at some point it, it can even unmoor itself and no longer be tied at all to the thing that initially started. Okay. That's so it, it, it can, it, it, and um, in, in his case it seemed to, um, if his story is accurate, sure. it, um, it was remarkably debilitating and for him it wasn't until um, he had maybe a bit more control over it. But it wasn't until he um, started smoking as a as a young adult and doing drugs that he was able to do something with those things. And he would talk about how um, the ritual of smoking, lighting a cigarette, of stepping away to smoke, um, all these sorts of things were a way for him to suddenly, once he picked up chain smoking. To, um, to develop a set of compulsions and rituals that were more socially acceptable. And so we made that trend. Now why his parents didn't take him to a therapist? I don't know. That in of itself 
Yeah. Was this was in the seventies? <coughs> Excuse me. Late sixties, early seventies, I guess. So we all be one. Right. It might, it might be. Um, but some kind of taboo against that. But, but that that also could be there. diagnostic. That the family, you know, it's simply just yes. um, you know. So I don't know. And if you've listened to any of his stories, he's lots going on. Right? Yeah, it seems like <laughs> there. It seems lots, like there is a lot going on. Uh, but with him, uh, but he, he's prolific and he's on NPR yeah. and he's uh, on all of these. Uh, um, I guess there's shows in some mm. some regard, so he yeah, uh, seems to be doing pretty well and pulled his act together, at least literally. Mm. Uh, he, he doesn't have his own drink yet, too. but he's not quite at <laughs> that level of success, but he's moving in that direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's really interesting. So it, it took a sort of a life of its own, uh, moved away from the initial uh, starting point for him with the anxiety and the mm -hmm. move and the other kinds of things mm -hmm. there, so... And then you, part of what, what makes this interesting is, is that if you think about this psychodynamically, um, all of us come up with a solution for the things that we feel and the stressors we have. It's just some of us are lucky enough, either through genetic pull or um, having the right sort of um, developmental environment, we come up with much better solutions than the ones he came up with. We all of us have a way of... Uh, we have at least some modicum of maybe obsessive or compulsive things that move through us. But, um, for instance, um, uh, there's a, a hierarchy of, of, of ego defenses that they're talked about in, in the psychodynamic literature. And, a, uh, and one of the ones he exhibits is a good one to have, a sense of humor. So if you are experiencing that initial anxiety that anyone would feel, anybody would feel in a social setting, but you're able to tell a joke, that's the sort of defense that mediates and your affect, but in such a way that brings people closer. So it's certainly true that humor can go off the rails and can end up um, uh, running people away. I think my wife probably could talk oh, about that. I was going to say, we probably have plenty of <laughs> examples just from the show, not yes, right. at, at your home, but, uh, but, but the, 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 uh, of, uh, but, uh, the fact that I Certain things she says you should not find funny, and I can't help it. It's just, yeah, you know, that's that's a media <laughs> signal for you to find some funny. <laughs> funny. Nice, you know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but by and large, it's a much better defense than the compulsive licking of a light switch. Sure. Um, and so, but all of us have a pattern of symptoms, adaptive or otherwise, that we make use of, and they become something that's often referred to as character structure. They become. Um, it's reflex, it's like an autopilot, it's like um, an implicit map of our insides and our outsides that we sort of follow. And built into that are these, these solutions we come up with, these ways, and, and they, are, um, they are embedded. They're not something we're often aware of. They mediate automatically and reflexively. And part of what happens in therapy, you know, if, if, um, if our man, uh, Dave Sedaris were to, uh, as a kid, show up. Part of the goal would be is to help him to um, name and to acknowledge at least some of the anxiety he's experiencing. If you create a space, if he were a younger child and he did play therapy, for instance, you could find a way for him to be able to put into to words and some form of mediated action the sort of stressors that the move made. Uh, since he's a little older at the time, you might get him to be able to tell you directly or in the stories he speaks of. If you ask him what he's been doing and he starts telling you about a TV show he likes, sometimes those are small windows into talking about characters that he identifies with. And it begins some small movement for him to begin to put into words instead of these reflexive actions, the things he's attempting to mediate. And you uh, create uh, a, um, what's known as uh, uh, an environment of dyadic regulation. Okay. As opposed to the um, uh, uh, solitary, uh, there's diet regulation and there's mm. solitary, solitary regulation. That's not what it is. But it, it, it's um, there's a fancy term for it. But okay. Okay. when he is in these obsessive compulsive symptoms, he is stuck outside of the potential for diet regulation. The story begins with the teacher sort of making fun of him and sending a letter home. Mm. The story begins with a failure of potential diet regulation. If she had sat down with him, and it may not have been helpful for her to say, you know, why do you keep doing this? 
Right. But she could have sat down and said, hey, man, you know, uh, I know you're new here. And when did you guys move down? She could have started there. Okay. That would be the moment of potential dietic regulation. If that were successful in a successful treatment, part of what happens included maybe helping him to sort of name some skills he could utilize, giving him some tools to navigate these things. But he also would be able to internalize. He would bring the teacher with him. In the act of dietic regulation, you sort of internalize that sort of stuff and it becomes um, a new map, a new reflex, more adaptable. That makes any sense. Yeah, it does make sense. It does make sense because uh, the idea that we all are on this continuum a little bit mm -hmm. with this OCD, mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive kind of thing, and that we build some kind of structure as we go along. But for him, it was an extreme. Mm -hmm. I mean, licking the all these objects around in this world must have just horrified all the people mm -hmm. close to him. And. And look for a significant right. reason for this mm -hmm. uh, in some way. And you can see that. Um, it, it leaves him increasingly isolated and away from the potential for the level of dietic regulation that he needs. And probably his family is also under a great deal of stress. I think at the time his mom was, with the move, his mom was pregnant with, um, with his brother, I think. So there are all these familial pressures. So, um, and I think he had at that time two older sisters. I think he has three. Maybe his three older sisters. Wow. Um, maybe, I think that's right. And um, one of them may be a younger sister. I think he has a younger sister too. Or maybe I'm wrong. But mm -hmm. so there was, there was, there was nothing there, or there was minimal things there to help him to be able to to, to cope outside of that reflexive symptom. Um, so. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm wondering too, I mean, it seems like it was unconscious. He wasn't going in and saying, oh, when I get to North Carolina, I'm going to start licking the light switch. Mm -hmm. uh, this was something that just manifested itself. Mm -hmm. What's the explanation? I mean, why, why couldn't he realize, wait a minute, um, and think through this in some mm -hmm. way, kind of self-regulate? What do you think? Well, it, it's interesting because if you go with, uh, when I've worked with patients with OCD, Oftentimes, um, with them, there's something dangerous about thinking it. There's something dangerous about getting close to it. Um, there's an example that um, in, um, I can't even in the text, but with a woman who um, um, had, uh, her husband had taken a job and she would, had just moved into a new city, southern city, middle of nowhere, small town, and um, she began to, uh, and they, they moved, and she had just had her second child, she had a two-year-old, and she had a baby, and um, when she was leaving the house, if she were leaving the house with a sitter or by herself, uh, especially by herself with the kids or whatever, she would have to check the stove 500 times, she had to go back and forth, and she would have to do the locks almost 100 times. She just would, and she'd always had some compulsive trends, but they really become incredibly exacerbated. Well, part of a way to think about this, the um, what she may need to think to move past that, if we take a psychodynamic step, is to think about the anger she may have toward her husband, the anger she may have toward her kids. There may be an unconscious desire for the stove to actually burn the house down because she might want to be free of all the pain and struggle and stress that she's under. Right. So there is a way, there's a knot, there is a conflict between different parts of herself that find themselves tied to the symptom. And to untie the knot, you may have to get connected to things that are very difficult to think. Maybe even things that are impossible to think. For uh, Sidiris as a little boy, he may not have the capacity to be able to name these things. He's never, um, if he had lived in his hometown all his, up until he was 10 years old, he doesn't have the words to know what moving means. Someone may have, someone right. may have attempted to, to, so I think that's part of it. So sometimes the feelings are too much, but sometimes there's a conflict too. There is, uh, and this is very psychoanalytic and maybe controversial, and, Quarters. But at least with some obsessive symptoms, there's a danger to really peering under the symptom. 
because what you'd find there could be maybe very, maybe very dangerous and difficult. No one wants right. to think that they want to burn their family down. Right. But, you're having those kind of very horrible, unthinkable kinds mm -hmm. of uh, thoughts, mm -hmm. and uh, and being able to confront those, and that's hard enough for anyone to do. A number of folks that I've worked with throughout the ages, ages, I'm not that old. I'm yeah, old, but I'm not that old. But um, throughout my, my career as a, um, as a male hand model, uh, throughout my career as a, uh, as a therapist. What is it that you do? We've got to figure that out one day. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. yeah, what do I do? Right <laughs> That's another show. We'll get, that is. we'll get to that. But oftentimes, <laughs> some of the symptoms, the patterns you see, will be around things like pedophilia. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I'm a child molester. Um, I think I'm a horrible person. I, you know, mm -hmm. and that um, they can, you know, they'll um, can't drive past the park because there'll be kids there, and they'll suddenly, right. oh, I'm a, what, a, what a horrible person. And sometimes the symptoms serve the purpose of, um, or at least part of their purpose, is to punish. That um, the things that I feel are too much, and to um, project condemnation and aggression outward or a way to tie that knot. They offer a quick and, and not so easy but a difficult solution. Part of the work is to get someone to be able to, if not directly peer under what conflict may be, may be arriving at that, getting better at being able to feel the things that they feel. Right. Um, you know, I can think of an individual who um, had, uh, uh, had some, um, those fear of pedophilia and um, he had um, graduated from uh, a graduate program and uh, had, uh, uh, had just started a fairly lucrative career and was beginning to experience some success when his you know, obsessive compulsive symptoms began to reach a crescendo. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the work with him was untying this knot to see that at least part of this had to do with the fact that he, had, uh, he was now more successful than his dad. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, up until now he had he had lived under this this idea that his dad was as good as he could get, was um, was uh, you know uh, second to God in terms of his place in the universe, and to suddenly live in a world where he began to think about his father differently, his very success began to wreck the um, the the the, uh, the balance in the world that he had, and so beginning to get him to touch on those things began to get him to be, and it's difficult to see, well, how does, you know, fear of molesting kids connect with this uh, wrecked by success narrative? But what is central to it is really just affect. It is feeling. Symptoms are an attempt to be able to, um, to mediate inner experience, and um, uh, that can tie all sorts of things together that often seem not connected at all. Right. Or it could be that it was necessary for me to do that because he had good insurance and I, I wanted a boat. Okay, this was, you just, I'll, we were straight forward there. We just yeah. went off the rails just a little bit about the boat, but um, I really don't. No, like it's, it's not, I mean, it's difficult to face these kinds of things, and if the context of uh, uh, the family we're in and the environment that we're in uh, makes it harder to do that, sure, we're going to shy away from that. We're going to find reasons not to look at that. And as you said, it may be too horrifying for the person. It's, uh, you know, um, it ain't easy being human. And, and that's part of the, the, the takeaway from this is that you can look at someone with his, the extreme symptoms that Sedaris had with the licking of the light switch, but we can see embedded in that um, something um, existential, <coughs> something that is central to the human condition. We have to come up with a solution that allows us to live. and. We don't, um, we are not solitary in that. We don't do it by ourselves. It requires um, people in our life to help us to do that. And no matter how, how good they are, sometimes they're not good enough in some ways. We have uh, genetics and biology give us a certain, um, uh, there are certain factors there that we, that we are, that are like cards we are dealt. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things sort of swirl together and they, they, we, we come up with a way to do something with those. Right. And when you look at an extreme situation like Sedaris, I mean, think about yourself. If you think about the things that you do. Think about the way in which you mediate stress. Um, one of the more common ways would be, you know, lots of folks, the first thing they do when they come home is um, uh, 
either on the weekend or usually the weekend, they will, they will Netflix binge. Right. And you may say to yourself, on one level, right. that's okay, Netflix binge. But that can be... Uh, by if the way, not... uh, it happened at my house uh, really? this couple of days ago with mm -hmm. the uh, third season of Stranger Things. Stranger Things, uh, Stranger Things, yes. So. That's, uh, that's, um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to take you off yeah, on we, that. We, we have, like... i gotta, I got to watch that Stranger Things. That's, uh, that's that one about... Um, uh, it's got Ducky in it. I, I'm not going to say anything. Okay. I tried to talk about it the other day. I was shushed at the house okay. because we didn't want to reveal anything. Okay, okay. So, right, 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 right. okay. Try to be, uh, but see, respectful. A Netflix binge can be symptomatic because it can be another solution to mediate certain affect states. We talked before about that notion of you find that window. We can move to a place of compulsive activity in the Netflix binge, and it's different than looking a light switch, but it can, in the end, keep us maybe even stuck in some ways that Sedaris also was. Um, a weekend spent Netflix binging doesn't allow you to think about the week before, the Monday through Friday, that generated the need for that compulsive activity. And it is possible if you are allowed and to get close enough to things that pushed you toward that symptom to suffer just enough to feel them, you might be able to come up with a more adaptive solution. You may be liberated, you may grow in a way that allows you to have more of a life than a life that you have to attempt to escape from on the screen. Right. Well, I guess we have to use what we have uh, at hand in some ways. Um, <clears throat> so, what happens if you don't adapt to this? I mean, you were talking about, I mean, he, he obviously kind of pushed through this and worked through it in some ways. He made a lot of dough. The Sedaris guy, he's yeah, successful. He's, he's, well, he's got to... So, so uh, what, um, what happens when you don't have the opportunity to work through it? That sounds like a, like a terrible place to be in your life. and. Uh, it would constrain you from ever kind of growing. I think there are folks who are literally debilitated, who are, um, uh, who, are who are trapped. That, uh, uh, there used to be a saying in, um, in trade circles that if you scratch the surface of, of an obsessive, you get a psychotic. And what that really means is, is that um, uh, untempered. And what often happens is, as part of our developmental arc. Is, um, a lot of uh, uh, emotionally difficult uh, or a lot of psychological symptoms can have some level of remission as one moves through age they can sometimes and so it could be that folks who initially have these sorts of things they may even out uh, they may find a way that they, they may uh, disperse uh, you'll notice lots of um, pre and adolescent and post adolescents will develop certain tics those will come and go, uh, and those may be uh, connected with, uh, you know, the rapid myelinization of, of uh, different um, uh, hemispheres, which uh, can be connected with uh, uh, increased executive functioning control, all that sort of stuff. So there, there, there are neurological sort of hallmarks uh, and markers one move through. But um, some folks never; these things don't remit, and instead they find themselves. Forever, I do. It's, uh, it sounds like a pretty rough place to be for a lot of folks. Well, I, I was told at one point that um, you know, being a little bit OCD was good while you're in graduate school mm -hmm. and you're working on uh, yeah. advanced study. So I was I told know, a little psychopathy was good. Okay. <laughs> Until they found the bodies, and then they were like, "Look, man." <laughs> you got to you got to stop this if you're going to graduate. Okay, I heard that. Yeah. But with, within Western culture, especially OCD, um, a little bit of that is good. We sort of have to, in some ways, differentiate between OCD and OCPD, depending on who you're talking to. Those can be radically different things. Uh, but if um, the capacity to de to develop and maintain the structure certainly is uh, within Western society very important. OCPD, the more central thing is control. That also, a little bit of that can be important. If you have the capacity to be able to, to direct and mediate and control over the things that you, you feel and things that you do. So, would come in handy. Uh, that said, though, I'm sure you can think of folks that you may have attended graduate school with who 
or professors, for instance, who did that. And then put in students in there. Students, uh, yeah, you probably have some <laughs> let's get, students. Let's cover everybody. Uh, don't. As best uh, we can, uh. Yeah, I've uh, I've had um, bosses and administrators. Uh, <laughs> Everyone up the line. <laughs> there are lots of ways yeah. where you are. Uh, you know, um, there used to be a when you were a kid. I don't think they, I haven't heard my son say this, but when I was growing up, there was you would say so step on a crack and break your mother's back. And um, uh, this saying goes all the way back to Freud. Freud put, uh, writes about it, and it's called the Talian Tal Tal Principle. Okay. Um, and uh, I think I maybe on that. It's the idea that you know, uh, for Freud, it's um, there is uh, an excessive enjoyment about dancing around cracks that could potentially kill your mom. That that's in some ways the essence of a symptom. Uh, to lick a light switch doesn't just mediate inner tension; it brings with it its own sense of enjoyment. Um, a guy by the name Jacques Lacan, again, not Jacques Lacan, very different people. I know. Uh, use that. To the albums are different. The music is completely different. Very, very, very different. You can yeah. dance to both of them, though. But um, <laughs> um, he called it jouissance. And it's the idea that there is an excessive pleasure to these things. So part of what also drives a symptom is if you're, you know, if you're set, just walking along and trying not to jump, step on cracks, well. but if suddenly in your mind you fantasize, well, if I step on this crack, this crack, I'll kill my mom. Suddenly it becomes a game. It begins to have all the, there's a charge to it. Right. And so Khan, um, he wants to, uh, to emphasize that there is there is an enjoyment, an excessive enjoyment in our symptoms. They allow us to, um, there is something there, a sort of obscene pleasure that drives these things too. And then part of untangling is being able to do something with that as well. Right, there's a lot to manage <laughs> in these situations for for folks going through this, but a little bit uh, goes a long way, as they say. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll figure out what needs to, uh, what you need to do in therapy. But I think you you said it earlier that uh, we need to approach these issues in some ways that without the blame necessarily. Because I think your example a few minutes ago was like the teacher coming at it mm -hmm. at the person and saying. You know, what's wrong with you as opposed to talk about why what the situation was like moving to North Carolina. Well that does in some ways um, go against my um, shame based based parenting techniques. Parenting. I hope you don't use that in therapy. Do you use <laughs> no, no shame, I would take that question shame, back. Shame based that therapy. Wrong. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it would be you know you lousy yeah, light switch yeah. looker. <laughs> that's not. Uh, that's not really going to help. That's not. No, uh, that's not going to help. Not, and not. as well, you know, well, it's interesting so. because it actually can. Uh, well, shame doesn't help. But no. one of the things that we, we talk about in one of my favorite kids, Lily B on there, uh, says that our first role as therapists are to survive the patient. And right. I would say that uh, our first role of any social encounter is to survive the other. And so. Someone who is licking your light switch is a harder person to survive. Someone who is in front of you rocking back and forth, crying hysterically, saying they're a child molester because they had these thoughts, is hard to survive. So part of what, um, to be able to lean in, to be able to mentalize the person across from you, is to be able to, as best you can, see the humanity, and if you can also see where your own symptoms may that you are at least part of that continuum. I may not be someone who looks like Switch, but I am someone who does this and this and this and this. Right. You know? So. Um, wow. There's a lot. It's a lot to, to think about there. But, um, and thank. Hopefully, they, uh, the thinking involves someone with really good insurance. Because I got right. a boat. Yeah, you, you boat. Now I got to get yes. a boat. <laughs> right now, I, I couldn't afford a dinghy. Right. How about, how about a float for the uh, pool that we probably Yeah, like uh, those floaties. <laughs> yeah, I, can't, uh, I couldn't even afford floaties. Floaties, no floaties. Floaties. That's terrible. No, it's a it's terrible like, situation. Yeah. Well, we'll Good, take uh, donations at the end of the show. Then I'll pitch well, yeah. in for some, uh, some floaties for you. But that's I still should work in commercials. Like, you know, the guys upstairs, we'll, 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 we'll do a commercial for them. They'll, uh, 
let's leave the guys upstairs <laughs> out of this conversation until we uh, bonded our friendship. Okay, then we can move. That's forward. actually a referral to, uh, to to not God, but uh, as people don't realize, we are um, uh, polytheists, so we believe in many gods. So that's reference right to the the, the gods okay. who are guiding us, and you know Zeus and Apollo and and others <laughs> and Ed Norton. <laughs> I don't know. Or the Tweet of God, I think, is out there on Twitter. What, so. what is it now? The Tweet of God? Yeah. That's <laughs> that. God tweets now. God tweets? Uh, I hope. Some situations, um, but uh, <laughs> they can't I, shut him down for some reason. I hope he's not tweeting he anything, out of, <laughs> anything <laughs> le from Leviticus, you know? Wear mixed fabrics, I'm going to send you to hell. Those <laughs> things I wish I hadn't uh, brought up at this moment, <laughs> but uh, that's what we do sometimes, so what do you know? <laughs> All right, man. Well, that's been very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, what else? Well, you're not supposed to have. Is this like radio? You can't have dead air. Um, we can have dead air. Yeah. <laughs> dead, yeah. That's, that's, some people would say it's called in, in the, it's called post production. <laughs> Here it is. So we can, it is. We can, we can just find can. that moment where we can stop to get to the. Next I think one. there are only two kinds of air in this room: hot air and dead air. I think there's really <laughs> no. You got no. Uh, no which is more? I don't know. Well, well, you brought up something earlier, and in some ways, there's a way to connect these. Yeah. Yeah. Well, about, we're not, um, I, 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 about I, ideology. The more well, people I certainly want to talk about it. So, so we, we, we can say that for later if you yeah, want. Yeah, uh, well, we need to t we need to have a, a, a longer time to kind of get into it, but let's talk about it for just a second. Well, Set this up, sort of a... We you talked about this notion of ideology, like why are people like, um, you know, like, so, um, let, let's uh, not, not uh, we, we should remain, should we remain apolitical or do we, do we wade into the fray? Well, I would say at this point, there's no way escaping <laughs> <laughs> from the well, politics because it's uh, in the air that we breathe at this point. So well, I, I have a couple of, careful we don't go, of friends you know. from, uh, from, from Tennessee where I grew up who are very conservative. And so they often send on the Facebooks. I don't know if you got one of those Facebooks. I don't know if you know any that does. I've heard of the Facebooks. But, um, I got one of the Facebooks. And they send, they send these. Uh, and um, they often say things like, you know, like... Uh, Immigrants go home. I don't like line breakers. Or uh, that was one they go about breaking in line. Breaking or you know, um, um, there are pictures of Trump as if he was drawn a little like he might be some sort of Christ figure. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's an ideological component to that. Sure. And Absolutely. you were saying that why do people cling to that? Why do people? Yeah, that's, sort of that's say, kind of the question. Why do we need that? Mm -hmm. In other words, we can't really sort of independently think about things as they come and make choices in that. We have to sort of join uh, well, a particular ideology and then march to that too. Right. And that, I find that very interesting. This is how this connects because um, there's a, we'll, we'll go with Lacan again. Lacan has a famous saying that uh, reality is structured like fiction. Okay. And uh, only the non-duped air. That's another one. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, it, it, <laughs> we may we may have to have some disclaimer at the end of this show, but and, and also a definition, some wait, 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 wait. terms used during this, this show. But what he means by that is is that um, uh, the only way you can be wrong is um, is not to be fooled. And what that means is is that um, um, we can only tame, we can only exist or make use of reality through some sort of mesh. Through symptom, through our own histories, it is it is always to some degree wrong. So there is a fiction that we create to be able to that it involves us and the people around us, and this fiction is how we we move through the world, and it is always to some degree untrue, because it, it has to be. It is always to some degree unfinished, and what happens with um, rigid ideological structures is they. Um, they become rigid, fascistic, and they no longer allow for the movement that, that what one needs to have with, uh, with our necessary fiction. You could imagine a, a dialectic of illusion and disillusionment and illusion and disillusionment that allows the growth of a mind and a spirit to be able to get bigger and bigger and embrace the world in, in, a, in a better and better fashion. But on some level we have to cling, when we talk about learning theory for instance, that, uh, there's also a famous uh, philosopher that said, um, all learning is, or said, uh, there is no learning without suffering. And that's the whole notion of assimilation versus accommodation from P. James' standpoint. That to assimilate is not to alter the fiction and the illusion we live with. Uh, 
To accommodate it, however, is to have to alter that, and that is almost always painful. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm picking on my friends in Tennessee, but for instance, this notion that, you know, immigrants go home, nobody likes a line breaker. Um, they may be narrowing their idea of what this, this um, and the, the, what makes this ideological is, in many ways, that most ideological systems often have, um, um, uh, Lacan calls it a, a, a quilting point, or um, some notion or idea that sort of ties everything together. Uh, a lot of right-wing ideology, this notion of freedom, freedom isn't free, or, you know, uh, this, this notion of America almost as if it's a, uh, sort of a saturated symbol. Well, in this case, it's the immigrant, and that there are outsiders that we should be united against, and we should be united against them underneath the American flag, and they are trying to get in. They are doing something unfair and wrong. And so, um, that is a helpful illusion to have because it makes the world make sense. It creates, creates a fiction that you can live in. But it, there's a tremendous amount of information that, that, is, that, is half, that has to be repressed or, uh, in fact, you can also, what often happens in the system, this is all psychological. The, um, the, uh, the immigrant gets to own all the projections. Um, you don't have to think about your own difficulties in a certain way because you can, you can project them into the immigrant. Right. So it offers, again, that, that a really tidy uh, fiction illusion that one can live under. But what's missing in that, what was challenging is if you were if you were to take my friend from Tennessee and we were having, you know, I said, well, you know, what if you realize that you know, a certain percentage, I don't know the percentage of it, 30% of those are actually women and their babies. They are fleeing because if they stay where they're at, they might be killed. Or that they see a promise for a world where their children may have the things you've been able to give yours. Should they do it? If you were to say that, would it open up the possibility of some level of accommodation? Doesn't mean that he suddenly has to, you know, uh, throw away his entire platform platform of immigration. He was, uh, but there's the possibility of being able to think about this differently. Now, as an aside, we've talked in here about Slava Zvijak. He got in a yes. lot of trouble and made, a, and made a lot of his friends upset when he said that, um, um, that, um, he said in a way that was very provocative, but what he, what he said is, as long as we focus on the immigrant, we are never going to fix the global problem. Why in this world where we have enough resources are there places that people want to flee from? The, the right focuses on erecting borders, and the left focuses on creating a space for these people to come to. The real issue, neither are tackling. Why are there places in the world that people need to run from? That's what we need to fix. And that an ideological system keeps you from being able, the, the illusion of the system keeps you from being able to directly deal with the thing you need to. We don't often ask ourselves that question. No, it, it's, it's probably just too tough for us. And besides, if you're in this ideology, one or the other, or ones that are out there, it's comforting in some ways. It's not, I mean, it's nice to have all the people around you agreeing with this and you have it and you feel like part of the team, if you will. And uh, it's, a, it's a safe space in some ways to kind of protect it. But what you were saying was, this is all fiction. Because well, it's a bigger, bigger question. And, and we would say that again from a Lacanian perspective, that's why the non-duped air. If you really want to get in trouble, then um, so, so in a way it talks about the, this notion of red and blue pills, mm -hmm. that should truly be awake, um, if there was such a thing that you could take a red pill that made you completely aware, as best you could, the world around you, it would be a buzzing confusion. You would be assaulted by all the things around yeah, you. There's too much going on, and yeah. contradictory thoughts, and the ability, that ambiguity, and so forth. Yeah, this so, very yeah. table, you know, um, would, would uh, it is far more in flux than our senses allow us to know. The world around us is far more in flux than the world that our senses allow us to know. So there is no such thing as direct perception. There's always apperception. It's always filtered through both the limitations and the developmental maps that we've been given. And 
an ideology is just a specific kind of map. It's usually the sort of map that an entire culture moves under. There are there is capitalist, there is socialist. Socialism also is like that. Somebody sent me a meme day, one of my friends from Tennessee, very conservative, he said that this is no longer Democrats versus Republican. This is America versus socialists. Trump 2020. And you'll notice that um, now that could be either a clever marketing tool that Carl Rhodes somewhere decided yeah, to come up yeah, with. Yeah, what happened to that guy? <laughs> but, yeah, okay. can't think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, somewhere in the background, something's going on. I'm, I'm sure. Yes. All right, but yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, but it's a wonderful sort of ideological device because it's an attempt to be able to say that if you don't support Trump, you're not an American. Right. And you're this thing called a socialist, which is an, in what Lacan would call an empty signifier. What does that really mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, um, it's like, um, uh, Zizek talks about this, the uh, yeah. Schrodinger is Mexican. And if you'll know that a lot of this immigration, that there are uh, the, the Mexican individuals coming across the border illegally, either stealing our jobs or doing nothing and soaking up all our, our uh, social security. How can they do both? <laughs> so yeah, you run into a contradiction <laughs> at some point where it doesn't make sense. Well, what you say say it because it's an empty signifier. It doesn't really mean anything, not really. It's just a way to be able to bind all these things together. So when you say the word socialist, what does that really mean? Really? And the person on with the bumper sticker, if you ask them, they may come up with a whole bunch of list of things. Many of them which could be just as contradictory. You know, right. so let me get this right. Socialists want to do this and this and this. And when you begin, to well, wait a minute, have you met one of them? Well, no, we said they're everywhere. Well, where, where is <laughs> this? Well, you know, they? they're, uh, they're Bernie Sanders. And so it sounds like, you know, Bernie Sanders is, you know, so, and, and then you, it, when you begin to unpack that, well, you know, it doesn't. So, so you're saying Bernie Sanders wants the government to, to uh, outlaw churches? Is that what you're saying? And then you know, so there often becomes this sort of like, uh, but it's, it, there is an empty signifier in there dancing around that, that, um, that is there simply as a placeholder to keep this ideological symptom in place. It sort of whirls around it, right? Right, and, and the contradictions don't seem to matter. I mean, if you're watching the, the times we're in and all the media and what's happening in politics and so forth, it seems like there are direct contradictions, but they're either excuses or they just go on without commenting about these things. I find that very difficult to understand. The, um, well, and the, the commentary, like, and it can be it can be difficult in lots of ways because some folks on the left, and there are folks on the left criticizing a, that um, the Me Too movement and uh, awareness of, um, of uh, misogyny and abuse itself, if we're not careful, could become something other than we intended to be. That's a controversial subject because I'm not really sure. You know, there's ideology in that statement too. But it is possible that, you know, if you go back to Zizek's idea about where we get tripped up in immigration, um, if, if we focus, and he, I think which is before, he talked a lot about um, uh, some of this conflict with transgender rights, that um, what often seems to happen is we're just finding a way to integrate one more person into the world instead of this one more person may be able to have the seeds for change for the entire world. So, so those on the outside. Um, if you ask um, um, in uh, Nazi Germany, it talks about the figure of uh, the Jew. And for the Nazi ideology, they were like, you know, again, they were like uh, Schrodinger's Mexican. On one level, they were um, degenerates who did nothing but sucked up uh, resources, but they also controlled everything. You know, and like, right. okay, <laughs> that be? <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, but that's because in the end. They just, they served a purpose, and unconsciously they structured this entire system. But if you were to ask someone on the outside, um, it is from them, they might be able to observe, well, wait a minute, that, that their vantage point might allow them to see something that people who are trapped in this ideological system can't see, if they were able to speak. So how do we give voice to the marginalized in such a way that they may be able to change the majority? They may deliver a truth that creates an act of accommodation societal level and we have to be careful we have to find a way to be able to keep that voice intact and able to speak so yeah
think we need to we need to have that uh, available to folks. But I mean, it, you, you, at first, it's a it's this issue of insight. Um, am I really thinking what I what do I believe in and why? Let's get to that point as well and begin to assess things. I don't think people are analytically or otherwise being critical thinkers about it. It seems like we're just accepting of some things because we want to fit in. Almost a Maslow when the hierarchies of Seriously, others, you know? and this is kind of some rabbinal stuff, but uh, if you follow some of the Zizek stuff, he would say beware of critical thinking too. Okay. Because um, there's often a, a need to get lost, and it's often in the stumbling that you find yourself. So it is possible that the uh, the repentant racist may have an awareness and may may be a potential for change that even the marginalized individual may not be. Um, so it it, um, it may the it may require the stumble and the fall. And then a retroactive critical analysis of the stump to be able to move the individual forward in the way that we want them to go. You may have to fall down before you can rise up. That may be, uh, that, that may be the, uh, the, 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 uh, the model of how this is supposed to happen. You may need to look at few light switches before, uh, you know, before you can be aware of yourself. You may right. have to move and um, you have to move through the symptom in a way. To get to the sort of truth you need to. Okay. Well, uh, fi final idea about this uh, uh, with this ideology notion, and I like the way you tied it into the OCD a little bit there. But, but the idea of is this healthy? I mean, to to just sort of cling on to the ideology and wear the certain hat and do the certain things. Uh, where does it end up? But is it healthy? And how do we get out of it? What do you think? Well, you know, there's not a lot of there is some data, and it's, again, it's often filtered through politics. But oftentimes, folks who, uh, depending on uh, uh, how rigid an ideological edifice or system is, and depending if it's on the left or the right, um, we do know that uh, individuals, particularly if, if uh, uh, their ideological system is more tribal, to the degree that it is tribal, there are higher incidences of, um, of hypertension, diabetes, there are all these sort of ill health effects. So there's some data to suggest that there's something difficult and dangerous about any sort of rigidly held ideological system. Right. But I suspect that uh, my friends in Tennessee, the one of my friends in Tennessee did have a heart attack like 10 years ago, so, mm -hmm. or maybe two years ago. So mm -hmm. that made them that, that, that matter. Watch me all suddenly heal over right now, but no, I'll try not to. Try not to. But I suspect, though, that on some level, it probably is healthy to have some sort of system. And if you stay within a context where there are no um, cognitive dissonance, if you watched only one news show, news channel, if you you know existed within a certain bubble, you probably would be relatively comfortable with that. And we do know that um, in terms of measures of happiness. Depends on how you, again, that's a hard thing to, uh, to operationalize. Right. But folks who skew toward the right report higher levels of happiness. Um, they report, you know, um, so the more conservative you are in those sense. And that makes a certain amount of sense because if you move toward the left, you're much more aware of uh, systemic problems. Uh, if, if your ideological system says that God will sort it out in the end, then you can rest easier than someone who believes that. We have to fix these you gotta, things. We got to work hard to yeah. fix these things. Yeah. So you know, that, I think that's part of what's insidious. We may be saying that uh, to move outside of one's ideological system is to risk health and to risk. Um, uh, it may put you in some sort of danger. If uh, if no one learns through suffering, then you're going to have to move through something painful to get outside of an ideological system. So to answer your question. Maybe, uh, maybe it would be better if we were all Nazis. Okay, that was not exactly the uh, answer I was looking for. I will say I this don't though. know how to recover from that one. But, I will say this though. They had cool uniforms. <laughs> yeah, the uniforms were cool. All right, so we can go to that. This is going to get us in the big trouble. Actually, you but but the, 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 this right? is also one of the things that, uh, that this guy G.J. writes about. Because um, 
Nazi ideology um, was very much about, um, um, it was not a sex and drugs and rock and roll, it was very much about discipline, rigidity, it was about um, uh, not even, God, I don't know, you weren't supposed to, everything in moderation, or, so there were all this sort of, and so Zizek says the reason why their costumes looks cool because they had, that's where all the renounced pleasures surfaced, that um, they, because they weren't allowed to kick it up at home, they would have these Nazi, would look like, you know, socialist, or they weren't socialist, that's not a, that was a good thing, we can talk about that. Right, but right. They, but, uh, um, Clarify. That they weren't. Uh, that's why, like, they had these giant rallies where everybody's like, you know, it's like this sort of political right. orgy rallies. Right. And that, that um, the, the uh, ideological system uh, allowed a return of the repressed in moments like that, so their uniforms were cool because the contents were under pressure, and that's where some of this, that was this pleasure surfaced, you know, wow. and those Nazi boots.